welcome to the new series. Coming up, I pimp my Spectrum Plus 3. I play some games. Jeff starts his new Spectrum Next section. And I chat to Alan Turvey. Let's get on then. The Spectrum Plus 3, the last Spectrum. Released by Amstrad in 1987, this final swan song included a 3-inch floppy disk drive as part of Amstrad's push to get the machine aligned with its own CPC range. Typically, Amstrad made some design decisions that broke older elements such as Interface 1 compatibility and the removal of the video signal from the edge connector. They also released the machine with a broken audio output causing differences in volume between the AY chip and the beeper, and also distorted signals. Amstrad later fixed this with the release of the Plus 3B revision. As time marched on, the floppy drive belt often broke or disintegrated, meaning a costly repair or complete replacement. Jumping forward to modern times, and there are several options available to Plus 3 owners wanting to use their machine now. The audio can be fixed and improved. The floppy drive, although authentic, can be replaced with a more versatile and reliable alternative. So let's start with that then, the floppy drive. Yes, I like using it, but if I'm going to be storing data on those 3-inch discs, I need to know I can get to them when I want them, and not to worry about read-write head problems, or disc deterioration, or the drive mechanism failing altogether. And this will become more evident in future episodes. This then is the GoTech floppy drive, a modern electronic floppy disk drive that can be used in a multitude of devices like synthesizers, sewing machines and of course computers. This is a lightweight, easy to install option that uses files stored on USB pen drives to emulate actual disks. They can be swapped and read and more importantly written back to just like real disks using the existing plus 3's ROM commands. The Spectrum treats it just like a disk drive. Fitting it is relatively easy. You open up the machine, being careful of the keyboard cables, unplug and unscrew the floppy drive, swap in the GoTech, plug it all back in and reassemble. The Plus 3 is now much lighter. Adding .dsk files to a pen drive and you're ready to go. When you turn on, you can use the two buttons on the front control panel and you can select a DSK file to use. Once selected, you press the load option as you normally would a floppy drive and the program will load. You can store files in different folders to make it easy. And to get to the root, you press both buttons on the GoTech. Unlike DivID devices, this is not instant. It does emulate a floppy drive quite well, for accuracy, but it's hardly a long wait to get your game or utility to load. Loading games is now simple, with all those files on a single USB drive. And there's no disk swapping, of course. Writing to disks again is simple. You select a DSK file that is blank, you can format it and treat it just like a real disk. Saving files to it or erasing files is easy just using the standard ROM commands. And this of course means utilities such as Tasword Plus 3 will work flawlessly. You could write a letter, or in this case a quick review, and when you're ready just save it as you normally would. The Spectrum doesn't know any different. Now you may have noticed that there's no sound when loading, and that's because there's no physical mechanism, and there's nothing to make a sound but you can actually create one. Buying a cheap piezo speaker for about £2, you can set the wires into a jumper, or if it comes with one, all the better, and you plug it into these pins at the back of the GoTech, and this will generate a disk noise when the files on the USB are being read or written to. Mine, though, is very quiet. I may have bought the wrong sort of speaker, but it does actually make a sound. The GoTech drive can be purchased from various internet sites. I got mine from eBay, and I'm very pleased with it. It mixes new, modern, reliable electronics without changing the way the machine works and maintains the aesthetic, not having things hanging out the back. A great addition to the Spectrum Plus 3, then, if you want authentic operation, but with a more reliable option. Now I can hear you asking, that's all very nice, but how do you get games that did not have a disc release to work? Well, again, there are a few options. You can use an emulator to make your own DSK files, trying to save and load the games as you would normally, but that can be a bit messy, 
or you can use some tools written by Tom Dolby. Z80 on DSK or TAP on DSK. This command line tool allows you to convert either Z80 files or TAP files on their own or in a batch to a DSK image that can be placed on the USB drive. So for example, I want to build a small compilation with some games to test. First, I get the Z80 files, and this includes Jetpack, Astro Blaster, Manic Miner, and Fred. Now, two of those are 16K games, and Jetpack has problems on 1 to 8K machines, so this will be a good test. With those files in a folder, along with Z80 to DSK, I enter this long command line. It instructs the program to name the on screen menu games. It will take all four Z80 files and place them, rearranged for disloading, onto a DSK file called Comp1. The option after Jetpack will force the output to be 16K compatible. After some processing, we get a DSK file that we can now copy onto the USB drive and put it back into the GoTek. Once in, you press enter to get a menu, and because we've created compilation, you get the name and all the games we converted. You just select a game and it works, and even Jetpack works. Surprisingly, this utility adds the game's loading screen, which is a nice touch. What it does while processing is search the screen memory of the Z80 file. And if there's something there, it will use that as a loading screen. I made a few compilations with this, one with Ultimate Games on, one with Arctic Computing Games on, one with DKtronics Games on, etc. And they're quick and easy to load. And once you have the basic command line set and saved into a text editor, it makes it easier and faster to create new ones. The tap to DSK program does pretty much the same thing, but uses tap files instead of Z80 files. I chose to use Z80 because it reduces the overall size of the game output on the DSK file, meaning you can get more games on it. Now with that, what's next? Well, there's a quick fix that you can do with a basic soldering iron, and that's the R44 mod. This involves soldering a 1K quarter watt resistor across the R44 link. And this can fix any ghosting issues when using a SCART lead, and in some cases force the TV to switch to SCART RGB mode. It's worth doing if you're poking about on the motherboard with a soldering iron. Next, the sound. Right, there are several options to address here, and there are several solutions. One is to send your machine away to be fixed by a professional, and this will return your machine with a balanced audio output. Some SCART leads have electronics to try and do this as well, so be sure to check out that if you're buying one. But I wanted the best sound output I could get, and I wasn't going to send it away, I was going to risk it, so I bought a stereo kit. The Plus 3 has stereo sound, but Amstrad budgets meant the output was restricted to mono. The kit requires some soldering and case modification if you wanted to go that far, so let's get started. Here's the kit, I bought mine from Bike Delight. The instructions are clear, apart from one section which we'll get onto. First we need to undo Amstrad's mono restriction, and this involves cutting some motherboard tracks. Again the instructions are clear, but I'll say this now, I will not be responsible for any damage that you do to your own machine or yourself. If you're unsure in any way, send it away to be done professionally. Once you've done that, you need to solder a small circuit board onto the AY chip, making sure that the six legs are not shorted together. This can be quite fiddly and time consuming, and involve many burns. Next, we need to add two resistors to two of the legs, and this is the bit that isn't quite clear in the instructions. I can only assume that these go over the existing solder joints that I've just done, and not between them or instead of them. Now we need to give the circuit board some power, so we need to solder two wires to certain points on the motherboard. With that all done, we can test it. However, at this point, you can mount the stereo socket onto the case of the Spectrum if you wanted to. I preferred to leave mine hanging out of the back just temporarily while I tested it and made sure everything was working. Right, it's time to test the machine. With some stereo speakers plugged in, I turned it on and started to play some tunes. <laughs> Now the quality can be very difficult to get across on video, so I've taken two samples from the output. The first is from the rear port just before the mod, and you can hear and see the mono sound and distortion. And now, here's the same tune, taken directly from the new stereo port. Yes, much clearer, no distortion, and stereo. Well, 
that's my plus three modernized, ready for anything I want to try. I'll be playing some disc games and using the machine for various things in future episodes without worrying about losing data or having distorted sound. And that sound really does make a big difference. I spent a long time just loading games just to hear the sound. Again, I would just like to say for clarity, if you're unsure in any way about any of these things, get a professional to do it. This is Batman the Movie, released by Ocean Software in 1989. Ocean released several games themed around Batman, and this in my opinion is one of the better ones. It came with a huge instruction sheet which explains each level as well as controls and the story. Released late in the Spectrum's life and on disc if you could afford it, the game shows what could be done with the machine given six years of experience. The game has multiple levels in different styles, and we start with a platform variant. Here Batman has to track down Jack Napier whilst avoiding his henchmen and the obstacles in the level such as dropping liquid and steam. The graphics are great, with large well animated sprites, detailed backgrounds and smooth movement, and the sound is also very well done with some great music and effects. Control is easy once you get to know the key combinations, especially around the usage of the rope and batarang. The batarang is used to access higher platforms by throwing it up and then climbing up the rope. It can also be used to hit the henchmen. The henchmen pose a real threat. They can shoot you, collide with you or even throw bombs. In these cases it's best to move out of the way as quickly as possible, although you can throw your batarang at them as mentioned before. The graphics, as you can see, are monochrome, but scroll smoothly enough. And the difficulty is a bit hard for me. I found it tricky to avoid the henchmen, but that didn't make it a bad game, and I really enjoyed this. As Batman loses energy, his face slowly turns to the Joker, which is a great touch. If you can get past the first level, the next one begins, and this time Batman is driving the Batmobile on a busy city street. He has to avoid other cars, and take the correct turns as shown by an arrow in front of a car. I couldn't get this far sadly, so this footage is from the RZX archive. If you miss a turn you can spin the car around and head back. Eventually you get to the Batcave, and level 3 begins. And this is like one of those old mastermind games. You have to place objects on screen and you're told how many of them are right. And in my opinion, there's no real need for this section. Level 4 sees Batman flying the Batwing and you have to cut the ropes of the balloons. This is because each balloon contains a toxic gas. The more balloons that are cut free, the higher the score. If you collide with them or miss them, the gas is released and you lose energy. Complete this and it's back to the platform style game, with Batman trying to track down the Joker on the roof of the cathedral. This level mechanic is the same as the first one, but obviously a bit harder. Overall, the game is well presented, with some great music, sound and graphics. It's easy to play, but hard to beat, and has always been close to the top of any Spectrum games list. For us old timers, this reminds me quite a bit of Quicksilver's Fred, only with upgraded and better graphics and sound, and a bit of a story added, and of course, the Batman license added to it. It's a great game, so don't shoot me down, it's just that it's too tough for me, 
but it's still worth playing and it really shows how far software came from 1983 to 1989. Originally an arcade game released in 1986 by Tecmo, Solomon's Key was quickly ported to several systems, including the Spectrum. In essence, this is an arcade platform puzzle game, and a very good one at that, with a nice mechanic and good puzzle elements. It was released on the Spectrum in 1987 by US Gold, and this is the budget re-release I have. And the story goes something like this. Return to an age of mystery and intrigue, to a place in which the fabled treasure of King Solomon shone brightly. Each level has to be completed in a time limit, and to complete it you have to collect a key that opens the exit to the next level. You can destroy blocks and create blocks, and using this mechanic you can move around the screen trying to grab any bonuses or extra spells. Each screen has enemies to avoid, and some can destroy blocks as well so you have to work out the best method to stay alive and complete the task. Sometimes you have to get out of the way first and then work out how best to complete the level by getting the key etc. The graphics are really nice, very smooth and well drawn, and the sound is good too with some nice tunes and spot effects. And this game reminds me very much of King's Valley. It's good to play, but can be very frustrating until you find out the correct route to complete the screen. You do have a fireball weapon, although the key press that triggers it isn't mentioned in the redefined keys option. Working out the correct route is obviously the key to this game, and it may take a while for each screen, but I suppose this is the idea behind puzzle games. Although this one is very keen on killing you quickly, rather than allowing you some time to work things out. It's a very merciless game, which can become annoying, but if you like puzzlers, stick with it. It's a fun game, and can be rewarding when you finally work out how to complete that annoying screen. This is Ground Force Zero, released in 1982 by Titan Programs. With all the ground forces available to you defeated, you have been ordered to make an air attack on the city, and that city is New York. So states the inlay. It all sounds exciting. Let's have a go. Oh. Mm. It's just a standard bomber game then. Your plane moves across the screen, dropping down a line at a time as it reaches the edge of the screen, and you have to bomb the highest buildings first to avoid crashing into them. The idea is you clear the building so you can land. This is probably the most popular game for magazine typings really. Every magazine I've ever read had at least one of these at some stage in its life. The graphics are crude and moving character squares and sound is just standard beeps. You can change difficulty, but this just increases the size and amount of the taller buildings. It's not an impressive machine code extravaganza, is it? It's just a simple game, easy to play with one key. I think there's no more to say, really. Can we break into it? Yes, we can. Seems like they've set the ink to white as some sort of primitive protection, so that's easy to fix. And here you go! Ooh, lots of data statements at the top for the user-definable graphics, and there's all the code. Yes, it's a basic program, nothing special. But I suppose it was 1982 when it was released. I think that's as positive as I can be about this game. Let's see what happens if we complete it then, just for a bit of fun. Digging into the code, line 8000 holds all the building drawing routines. So if we change a few numbers, 
we just get one single building one block high, and then we bomb it. And now we have to wait. Here we go. Ha <laughs> ha! Now that was good. The best part of the game. I'm glad I did that. This is Last Train to Trans Central, released by Quantum Sheep in 2020. Now this is the demo version of a new release. If you want the full game, you can go to the website on screen and buy it for a small fee. However, the demo will give you a good flavour of the game, which will make your mind up. Space trains are the thing of the future and due to a glitch, the AI is sending them crashing into planets. To save them, you have to get the rogue AIs in each train to stop them. Each screen is a carriage of the train, and to get to the next one, making your way to the AI, you have to collect items to unlock the door. Various things have to be avoided, shot and climbed over to complete this task. The music is great and control and graphics work really well. There are also switches that turn off force fields. It's quite a nice game this. Very enjoyable. If you like this sort of thing give this one a try and, like I say, if you want the full version you know where to get it from. we're going to look at things to do with the Spectrum Next. This time we're looking at QB, which is a game by d -Lo Games, written by Daniel Lopez, with graphics by Simon Butler. Now the first thing I'm going to say is that Pogo was one of my favourite games on the ZX Spectrum, and like QB, it was a clone of the arcade game Cubus. I never really played Cuba a lot in the arcade. I don't think I ever really encountered a Cuba cab, but playing Pogo really gave you that arcade feel of Cuba. And what I was hoping for with Cuba was something that would be reminiscent of Pogo but with better graphics. It certainly has better graphics, but it takes everything and dials it up to 11. So it's actually a much more faithful representation of Cuba from the arcade. But QB goes even further because it adds extra elements that weren't in the arcade. The most noticeable of these is the fact that QB has small bombs. The first thing that strikes you about the game is the graphics. Simon Butler has done a terrific job, in particular the main sprite, the bee, QB, is really really cute and I really love the cartoony sprites that are on offer in this game. Going back to Cubit, one of the things that Cubit had is enemies that kind of bounced on the playing area as if it was inverted or turned, so they actually landed on the sides rather than the top of the blocks that make up the playing area. And unlike Pogo that didn't really do that, QB has that, and those sprites are really really good as well. In a recent retro gaming roundup, Simon says that he likes doing small sprites, and I think that really shows through in this game. Going back to the comparison with Pogo, it's slightly more forgiving than Pogo as well, which makes advancement through the levels that little bit easier. Having said that, QB is no pushover. It's a good game, the first few levels ease you into the game, but it is by no means an easy game. 
If I'm going to level one criticism of QB, it's the default keys. For some reason, and if you look at a keyboard, you'll see why I'm seeing this as a criticism. Down right is S, which is on the left hand side of your keyboard, and down left is L. Luckily, there's the chance to redefine the keys in this game, but that just seems a strange choice to me. So unless you've been living under a rock, you probably know how Cuba plays. You're presented at the start with a pyramid of pseudo 3D blocks, where you bounce your B around to change those blocks to the required colour. In the first few levels, you only have to bounce on each block once, then you have to bounce on each block twice to change them to an intermediate colour than the required colour. Then in level 3, which I haven't managed to get past yet, when you bounce on a block, it changes to the required colour, but if you bounce on that block again, it it will change back to the original colour. I'm assuming further on in the game there are intermediate colours between the required colour and you cycle through those, but as I say, I haven't got that far yet. There are several different baddies. The first are quite simple, they just come from the top and bounce randomly down the maze and jump off the bottom and then start again at the top. As with Pogo and Cubert, there is an enemy that will bounce down until it gets to the bottom of the level, transform, and then it will seek you out. Then there's the baddies that I said that move from left to right. They start at the bottom and bounce on the side of the block rather than the block itself. You have two methods of defence. One is the discs that hover at the side of the playing area. You can jump onto these and that will lead the baddie that is chasing you to jump off the side of the playing area if he's close enough. Doesn't always happen. Then the aforementioned smart bombs which clear the playing area of all baddies. You have a limited supply of these. You start with two and you can get bonus ones but you can never have more than three. Scoring simple, you get points for changing the colour of the blocks. You also get points for how many discs and smart bombs you have left at the end of the level. So it's a bit of a risk versus reward game in that you might want to use a disc, but if you use them, then you're going to get a low score. I definitely recommend this game to anyone who was a fan of the original Cubas. One thing I haven't mentioned yet is the sound. There's a really nice tune playing while you play the game, and there's also really good spot effects. So check out QB, it's a really really good game. So that wraps it up for this time, and next time we'll look at something else that's happening on the Spectrum next. Till then, happy gaming! new section I'll be chatting to Alan Turvey. You may know his name, he's written some excellent games for the Spectrum, including Perils of Willy, Terrapins and Roust. He's also hacked and updated games such as Bruce Lee RX and Jetpack RX, and also he continually develops AGDX, an extended version of arcade games designer, adding new functions, as well as AGDX Mini, the version that uses smaller 8 pixel sprites. Surprisingly, he's found time to get together for this series and talk about the things he's done and the things he's planning. Alan has his own YouTube channel, and the link will be in the description below. Welcome, Alan. Hello. Let's start with the usual question, then. Why the route that you've chosen? Why did you choose to do mods and game hacks? I mean, I know you've written your own games, but then you sort yeah. of diversified into, into that little, um, market, little market area, so to speak. Well, I suppose... One answer would be that that was something that I always enjoyed, you know, back in the 80s, let's say. I used to mess about with things like Manic Miner and Jet Set Willy, like a lot of people, you know, figuring out how... I've always enjoyed that, you know. I don't know I don't know about you, but I must have gone through about four or five tape recorders um, in the 80s because I could never resist sort of taking them apart and trying to fiddle with them, you know. I didn't, I didn't, start... I didn't start taking things apart. No, I, I was always fascinated by... Uh, Taking taking things apart and seeing how how they worked in more recent times. Well, I mean, I wasn't involved with the, in the spectrum scene for probably a good twenty years or more. I've come back, you know. This is this is my redemption. I've returned like a prodigal right. son, you know. <laughs> um, and it's all thanks to your show because I, I basically I stumbled on your show like two or three years ago, and 
kind of piqued my interest and I started watching it and I said, ah, oh, I remember, I remember we used to have a lot of fun, we used to have a lot of fun with that. Myself and a, and a, and a friend of mine who always liked hacking and writing our own games and stuff, so. Mm. And then um, on one of your shows, obviously you did a big feature on AGD and that really made me interested in sort of mess about, you know. I wouldn't say that I hadn't touched a Spectrum for 20 odd years. But. So, I mean, in this series of talks on chats and whatever you want to call them, we're going to be going through a couple of things that you've been doing. We've We've talked about the new games that you've written, uh, the games that you've modified, and the um, continued work that you're doing on developing um, AGD. So, I mean, yeah. let's start with AGD. Why not? I mean, we, we both use it as a tool. Um, all of my games, yeah. or most of my games, are written by that. And the original was written by Jonathan Coldwell, and you've um, developed it further and added a lot of new functions. And how was, how was Jonathan about that? I presume you've been in touch with him. Oh, absolutely. Well, I couldn't. I mean, it was. It would have been almost impossible. Well, I think it would have been impossible to to do the work that I did without um, Jonathan's support. You know, it all started maybe two or three years ago. I'd written a game, I think uh, Terrapins or maybe Invaders, and there was there were one or two things that I wanted to to change. And I wanted initially, I just wanted to be able to export and import graphics. You know, from yeah. from things like ZX Paintbrush. Initially, we were kind of trying to figure out myself and David Sapphire. I'm sure you you know David. Mm. He's done done a lot of Spectrum work as well, um, especially adding the music to AGD. Yeah, we got in touch with Jonathan, and uh, and he said, "Oh well, I'll I'll send you the source code. There's no problem. You know, you can right. you can um, you can make the changes, and I'd be happy to, happy for you to do it. You know, right." So, and, so what, um, what was the first thing that you added to AGD then? Because I, I know I, I know, and I've tinkered about with a few of them, but I, I can't, I don't know what the very first thing yeah. was. That well, in. I think probably the very first thing that we did was just display where the sprites were stored, hmm. which would which then would allow you to load data in from uh, ZX Paintbrush or wherever right. else. Okay. You know, that, was a, that was the first thing. The actual first kind of physical thing that I that I did myself was a very simple routine which um well all it did was it just poked the one of the background tiles mm. so if you see in if you see in the game terrapins you play level 1 and then level 2 it's the same as level 1 but it's just a different color okay and so it was just a poke you just poked the color of of one of the 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 tiles mm. you know very very simple things like that when when we first started as I was working on games, I just kept thinking, oh, I'd like to be able to do this, or I'd like to be able to do that. Yeah, you know? I've, I've been there and done that, definitely. Every so time I want to create something, there's always something that you wish that you could, you could do. Yeah, you know, so just we, things like, you know, rotating a sprite, or even as something as simple as pressing, a, a, you know, deleting blocks, you had to keep going, switch back to block zero, and things like that, you know, just little touches. And then it just kind of mushroomed. 